Welcome to the Austin All Day Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Powers, and this is episode 19. We're here with Chef Bill from Counter Cafe, his daughter Posey, and Chef Mike from Lonesome Dove. Both guests have already been featured on the podcast. Chef Bill was in episode 7. Chef Mike most recently was in episode 18. So if you haven't heard those, go give them a listen. This is a first for Posey. You guys sit back, grab a drink, and check it out. We're here now with... Two Austin All Day vets, Chef Phil of Counter Cafe, and most recently, in episode 18, which is the last episode recorded, Chef Mike Winkleman. It feels good to be a veteran, and you probably never <laughs> hear that ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys have both been through the, the works here, you know, you know the drill, and we're just here. I'm excited to be back. I had a fantastic uh, experience the last time, and... Yeah, I had a lot of fun, and uh, I uh, liked Phil's podcast. Um, that so is how this came to be, right? We were we were talking, and I don't know if it was offline or what, but we we were talking about your podcast, which has come up many times with many other people. That it's uh, people enjoy that one. That is very very flattering. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it, it was a fun one. It was entertaining. Mike related to you know a couple things that you were talking about, but to get you you had mentioned in your podcast more doing like a panel kind of yeah I, th- I think this is a lovely lovely idea absolutely so we've got Lonesome Dove Counter Cafe and you know that's just where the guys work you know right and uh, <clears throat> I feel like so I wanted like uh, you talked about um, been awesome a long time did you do any time at Ruby's barbecue in at any time uh, never never worked there I've definitely eaten at Ruby's uh, mostly like breakfast tacos in the morning on the way to a job site when I was doing right. landscaping that kind of thing but never worked at Ruby's um, you know the sauces boss. So they right. Say, yeah. No, in, yeah. Thirty thirty years. I feel like uh, uh, like I've run into people all over us. Like <laughs> oh yeah, movies. yeah. I worked there for a while. Like, yeah. I whether was, it was good or bad or <laughs> or different. But I feel like I got real lucky when I moved down here because I um, it was really at the the upswing of the dining, like the finer dining experience. Like people were starting to like oh you can mix like. Mexican flavors with Asian flavors. You know, it doesn't have to be hamburgers and, and barbecue. And so I kind of, I feel like I like skipped all the real Austin kitchen experiences. I never worked at Magnolia. You know, I never spent any time at Kirby. Yeah, I did that. Mid- yeah. Middle of the night. Yeah, I never worked at like the brick oven pizza. I never, you know, did any, had any of those gigs. So in a way I missed out, but in the way it was, it was really, it was really formative because I, was that I was able to see the nuggets of like the slow food movement take hold here and the nuggets of like fine dining and watch it blossom over the last like 20 years. So that's that's been exciting. Yeah, there was a, a, a few flashes in the pan though. I feel like um, one of my really memory of kind of the 90s, the, the fusion movement. I, right. I worked at Mars at one point. I where, loved Mars. That where, place was fantastic. Is it Olame that's there yes. now? And it was like, we had like wasabi mousse. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Like, wasabi mousse. It was just like, it was this really, which is, it was fine. I mean, I, I, I liked it, but like, it was this really kind of uh, just... Um, Deliberate, like mashing together, <laughs> uh, like sometimes uh, people forced things, yeah, 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 just out of like pure experimentation. But I'll tell you. So, speaking of Mars, I I'm still very upset that Mars ever moved locations. I mean, I get like, hey, let's go to South Congress. It's up and coming, and there's like all this redevelopment going on. But that was the death nail. Oh that yeah, was it. yeah. It was like there was no way that Mars was going to reproduce its success. On I'm unfamiliar with this. Mars is amazing. So yeah. Olame is like right there. I know where Olame is. Right. And it was the same structure, same building, building. Same building. Same building. They've it's added, like a house almost. They right? might have house. added it's, on it now with yeah. Olame. But. And they're doing very well. I mean, they're getting yeah, pretty Because that place is small enough, and I'm sure the rent is probably challenging on some level, but it's small enough and intimate enough that, and 
in that area, there's like no real competition. I mean, the closest other restaurant that had decent food, I mean, there's a few over there, but like, no. Hole in the wall? The clay, (laughs) hole in the wall. (laughs) Like hot dogs. Uh, It's too far. It's like, it's like a mile up the way. Yeah. No one's going to walk a mile. Yeah. Yeah. But for real, there was, um, you know, like the dog and duck pub was right across the street. So, or around the corner, I should say. I mean, they had like great like pub food. Uh, when I was working at Bertram's, we were across the street or around the corner, but that was mostly like a much higher end game. Like our price point was was vastly, vastly higher. You know, no one was going to, no one really, I could tell, could go in the Mars and was going to drop like 200 bucks on a bottle of wine. No, and, and if, I mean, that might have been the most expensive bottle yeah. of wine they would have had, but like. We had a few of those. You know they I mean? could turn. I mean, they could turn it and burn it decently. And man, the tandoori quail, oh, so good, man. So I like when you work in the tandoori oven. You like to do the the non. You got to drop. You got to take your chef coat off because, like, so after a while, you hit the lid and you. And yeah, because you, you're reaching this. It's hot, your rank. Hot. <laughs> yeah. You start getting your rank from hitting hitting the edge of it. By I need you to reach in this really hot hole. Yeah. <laughs> and and grab something that's up under the ledge and you're like oh man this is crazy oh yeah yeah it's like the mean version of the green egg yeah yeah <laughs> i like that yeah. you could probably and put it's that not outside. going anywhere it's no. built into the it's structure there. of yeah. uh, it's it's part of the foundation mars was mars was probably the sexiest restaurant in town the only thing i can think of now that's even that's that's kind of close would be like um uh, the place on like third or whatever, Josephine's or whatever it is, um, the French joint, uh, not Cafe Josie. Um, I think it is like Josephine's. It's like on East Third or whatever. It's beautiful. oh Justine, Justine, Justine's. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they had Mars had like it was all heavy on the like the deep reds and the dark light and like the pin lights. And I'll say, have sexy. you ever heard of the band Moog Cookbook? Well, look them up and listen. This is what I heard. Of, about this band because that's what they played in the dining room. Interesting. I loved Mars. I was very disappointed when it when it moved and then it and it shuttered and then it became Perla's and I was like, ah oh, man. Perla's. Yeah. So Perla's on South Congress yes. is what the Mars moved into and they didn't make it what, like six months? I don't think so. Thomas, <clears throat> I run into him every so often at uh, the hi hat over there on East Sixth Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um you know, I don't get in there too much. But right. Yeah. Been to the hi hat a few times, mostly for drinks. Right. You know, uh, hang out. I like their decor. You know, it's very, very. Rock Is it and roll. jazz focused? No, it's mostly just got like drums and percussions and instruments hanging. I I guess maybe the hi hat comes from just like the aspect of being in like a it's like a rock bar. Yeah. Know. Okay. It's yeah. not loud loud shows. What they no. have. It's it's kind of you know more mellow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the bands I've seen there, um, I've seen, uh, you know, bands that could be loud and raucous but they were always, like, you know, pretty relative to the room. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not made for getting no. rocked out of the place, for no, sure. But, it's a, you know, it's a fun little corner. It used to be a place called Cafe Brasseria. Oh, okay, I don't or, know. And that place was weird. It didn't have a... Like, they had a... Um, I only went there twice. A friend of mine, Andy, was, um, was a waiter there, and we went in one time, uh, my my baby mama and I at one point and they had a um, a steak tartare and it was really 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 strange it was super super oily it was almost like they had taken the meat and then just chopped it up and soaked it and like served it in it, like oxidated olive oil it was not a pleasurable experience <laughs> that yeah. does not sound no, it wasn't great and then every you know the idea was cool because everything they did was braised so it was like you know like so they were like hey everything's like braised whatever but yeah didn't last very long. So that back up to that Justine's. Yeah. Is that like really popular? I just met a guy from California. He's only been here five months and I asked him where he'd eaten. Justine's that was the is, first place he mentioned. Justine's is very popular. It's like okay. one of the so there used to I be a few more like really French kind of uh, establishments in town. And Justine's is the I would say it's probably close to being the last one. Um, she knew. She that, knew it will always be around. But yeah, that that hasn't yeah. like even budged. The menu no, hasn't budged no. in twenty years. I and feel it probably like. won't ever budge. Right. Um, but and what are the hours at Justine's? 
I think they open at five. Oh, it's late. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's and they wicked, close at like two. Late. Yeah. You know, but they're all, they're open uh, like Wednesday through Sunday or something. Oh, okay. So this place, okay. Yeah. It's I, close that, to it's close to where I live. I've been over there. I just was. I guess I'm thrown off that it's so popular yeah. given its location and everything. So it's a full on like traditional French menu: steak frites, escargot, um, a really. Pardon me, a really, um, a, you know, a decent wine list. You can get get in there and, you know. And that's a, a guy from Whole Foods opened that, right? That, have you, you guys. You know, I don't know. The 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 lore I heard, like the urban story. Oh, okay. Is that, that the um, the the woman that's a co-owner is French and her husband, I don't know if he's French or not. Maybe he's American, but she was originally like a, like a, like an art student or, or like maybe a, um, a movie student, like was into cinema. And then somehow or another, they opened up that place. And what they did was essentially, they just gave you a very like, I don't know. Uh, it's a very like bistro-y yeah, type a, menu. Like, yeah, a Parisian, yeah. like turn of the century Parisian experience. Uh, lots of like, you know, really beautiful, tall people in weird outfits. And it's almost like being so that in a movie. Is, that that yeah. Instagram there, that's what's really happening? Yeah. All those, oh. All, yeah, yeah. So there's beautiful <laughs> chandeliers and, a, and a old, and like the whole front tent is like, out front is this beautiful bar and With velvet like, curtains. And in the win- yeah, in the winter, they bring these like really lavish velvet, yeah. like almost heavy. theater, like yeah. theater curtains. Yeah. It's, heavy it's kind velvet. Of, it's a cool atmosphere. Fear, but in the fact that like the food, like the menu's always the same. It I'm, is because it's a just little, a French uh, restaurant. Yeah, I'm a little like not. Yeah, but I mean, if you want to go soon and feel super cool, oh yeah, it's like being in a. It's like being and in there's like a film. warehouse, and it's warehouses around it, yeah. so you can feel double Art cool yeah. for yeah. being in a warehouse area. Yeah, that's but. that's why I said I, I've definitely been over there, and not during the you know the hours they were open. Um, I guarantee you that they get a lot. I mean, first of all, they, I mean, I don't know what their hiring practices are, but well, they only hire girl, beautiful people. A girl, Vanessa. <laughs> they, oh, well, I, yeah, Vanessa is a girl I know who was in the back of the house there. Um, I'm trying to get her to, to hop on here. And definitely now that we're having like conversation like this, I want to know yeah. it's like working over there. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a uh, it's definitely like being on an art scene or in an art movie. It's got these like you know. I also need to rewind these because I I had a guy tell me it was a Whole Foods employee who went off and opened that. I mean, it's very possible. Right, it's yeah. very possible. I don't know for sure. You Your know, story is better. What the truth is, I do know that there's a one the uh, if you go to their website, there's like this. It's like a it's like a short you know video of you know a couple girls in a bathtub and whatever and that's all like the it's like the college movie one of the owners made. I it's was a, about to open the website and I just I just looked up their hours. Yeah, and well, it's, they, they they have a little like Hall of Mirrors building, yeah, and a little pagoda out back. In the yeah, back. they have a lot of space. Um, yeah, that place fills up fast. I went there um, for my birthday. And we rolled in at five o'clock, and they were filled up by five thirty. Wow, that is yeah, you know? that's serious. But the cool thing is, is that they allow you to enjoy your meal. So you know, I sat there and I had, I mean, dinner lasted for us like two and a half hours, and they weren't chasing us out. Yeah, you know, we got our first course, and then they, you know, they they brought us our second course, and they brought us our entree, and then a dessert, and I was able to sit down. I mean, I had enough time. For dinner, that you know, I ordered like a nice bottle of Chateau de Pop. I love a good like Chateau de Pop. It's one of my favorite wines, and they you know they decanted it for me, which is great because at a lot of places you go in and you drop like in this particular instance it was like two hundred bucks on a bottle of wine, and they they open it at the table and they don't even have the decency to let it breathe for you. Right. Yeah. And it's not going to be good for like I mean it doesn't really reach its potential for like a solid hour. They were like, hey, we'll just decant it for you. And so within, you know, 15 minutes, it had opened up, and it was already well on to being, like, fantastic, and everyone's, like, beautiful, and I loved it, man. Oh, I yeah. loved it. It's like... Well, and you're a wine guy. And I'm a wine guy. Yeah. It's, I don't know if you've ever been... I think it's called Peche. It's over yeah. on... Oh, right? th- I talked to the chef there. Right. Yeah, right the there time. on 5th. So yeah, that's right in the corner from us. He's yeah. one of these... It's this weird thing I have with him. We always see each other. 
on the street walking. That's awesome. And we always run across the street. We just like talk for a minute. I don't do any business with him, but we, we like I told him That's about awesome. the podcast and stuff. That's and awesome. He's always carrying like a Boldrick knife roll. And I always, right. You know, so spot like him if, a mile away. when you go there, you walk in and you're like, okay, at any time right now, like Baudelaire is going to walk in, he's going to drink some absinthe and he's going to try and stab me, right? There's something weird <laughs> happening. But it has that like, you know, like 18th century Parisian feel to it. Yeah. So Justine's is just like a hundred years later and a little bit bodier. Okay. It's uh, you know what it is? It's uh, it's uh, La Boheme. Yeah, it yes, is. It's La Boheme. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's is. La it's Boheme. Boheme. Which, by the way, just showed at, yes, the, at yep, the Austin yep. Lyric Opera this Abs- last yeah. weekend. Friends of mine La Boheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. La Boheme. It's one of the greatest Puccini operas of all time, dude. Where have you I been? I saw La Boheme. Okay. You sure did. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the six-year-old knows. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. So I got a question. Uh, you're a wine guy. Like, what do you what do you think's the most expensive bottle of wine in town, and and where? Like, oh man, you know that's hard to say. Honestly, the answer to that is probably something somebody has in their personal or or sta- like stash, a well but like a like a like a restaurant wise yeah yeah. Um, a couple weeks back, I was just I was out at the uh, what is it the steakhouse out there on the top of the hill? Uh, oh, Steiner Ranch, Steiner Ranch Steakhouse, and they've got a very extensive wine list and huge place. They have um, they have a number of thousand dollar bottles on their list okay so lonesome dove i think we've got yeah a couple thousand dollar bottles they've got a, they've got they've list petrus like petrus is on their list okay i'm i mean i'm not a big wine person i'm i'm uh perpetually just like complex that was so years ago in chicago i worked at true there was a Twelve thousand yeah. dollar bottle of yeah. wine, and we only you were only whatever allotted three of them to us. I don't know. Who, sure, sure. Know. But like, it, it, it's one of these things that like I'm very curious. Like, is it good because I told myself it's no, good? No, no, no. So I'll tell you. I'll tell you my experience. <laughs> uh, I was working at Bertram's, and the reason I say Petrus is because at one point I, I don't even know if you could get Petrus in the United States outside of like a, a private, like contact of some sort right it was all kept like in europe or whatever so the chef i worked for uh peter o'brien he was always in contact with these cats and he with these kind of the people that had this kind of money and so they did a petrus tasting and we featured like 1973 to like 1979 or something and in 73 they had this horrible blight that hit the crop they weren't even sure what the wine was going to be like or what the yield was going to be and they made it anyway and it turned out to be like the best wine they had made in like 500 years right okay we they did a wine tasting uh you know him and like the wine guy and like the owners and a handful of friends and the wine guy drank all his and like a few of the other people drank theirs but most of the people were just like you know i mean we're talking like four thousand dollars a bottle and they're swishing it around their mouth and like spitting it out in this platoon and like oh this is i really like this this has got like a velvet note to it whatever so me being in the kitchen, I nice. was afforded the opportunity to go downstairs and clean up the tables. So we went downstairs to clean up the tables because why not, right? And so in part of cleaning up the tables, we decided to go ahead and taste all these wines. And we tasted all of them. And then because we were pressed for time, we put them all into one decanter and we made the most awesome blend in the entire world. Uh, I ran to a guy a while back and I told him the story and he told me I was like some kind of crazed wine anarchist for having done this. But it was amazing. I never understood or could even completely fathom why anyone would spend that much money on a bottle of wine right. until it touched my lips. And I was like, oh my, this is like literally like, like this is like what, this is like what God is made out of. Hmm. So but this is so like when amazing. someone's like, oh, I've got all these wine. They're like, yeah, let me get the 12,000. They're like, they're like, I don't like it. Yeah. So <laughs> like, take it back. That's the yeah. catch though, is that with a twelve thousand dollar bottle yeah. of wine, it may suck because it may cork and there's like all these insurance indi- like issues that go along with it. Like who has to pay for that? Right, right. I'm you know? just like it's it's 
It's one of these things, like, uh, I don't know if you ever watched, like, Botany of Desire, where he talks about the uh, the tulip industry, you know what I mean? Right. It's the first, and, like, at one point in Holland, someone's like, wait a minute, why do we want tulips again? They're like, oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, the why? economy crashed or something. Like, why is this valuable? Like, oh, no one ever asked that. Yeah, before. yeah, it turns out it's not really valuable <laughs> at all. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, it's the wine thing is interesting from someone who doesn't drink wine because they have got craft beers like everywhere, right? And like that's there's like a huge difference between that and the wine thing because you're talking about crops and different years. Well, you but, can still now you can get a, a you know a 24 ounce beer that's like a sixty dollar beer. You sure you can, we, but like, but we can't like we can't even. T- Touch four thousand no. dollars, and the other thing is, is that you well, don't. Well, it doesn't s- take. I you mean, don't sell her beer. And okay, that's one of so the things there's, that, there's one thing. Time yeah, is be, a factor. Beer, time is a beer huge you factor. got two months. Like yeah. after two months, and that's that's the best beer is going to get. Some of those right. wines are so expensive because, well, one because they're good. Sometimes it's because of like with that. But when you say Petrus, when it touches your lips, I, it's I, fantastic, I, man. Because I, I'm, 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 I wanted to interrupt you because you're like, how can you justify like a four thousand dollar price tag? When you taste it, you understand. I I could never. That blows my mind. And I'm you so... have plenty of money too. And you have That's, plenty of money. Of course, That's you have not, plenty of money. Yeah, but like because so, four thousand. It's like ah, it's canceled. Some only of that's like supply and demand, uh, and some yeah. of that's like collectible stuff, right? Yeah. Um, if you have a Lafitte Rothschild, that's from like nineteen. 19- 62, it's valued at a certain amount because there's only so many of those bottles around. Right. No one's even actually going to drink it. At that point, it becomes like a collectible. Yeah. Right? No one's actually drinking it. Right. But some of those wines and a lot of wines that they're still making, so, for example, the last two years, last three years have been really crazy with weather in Europe. Uh, I heard an interview with the head winemaker, the the head, uh, the master guy at, um, uh, in they do a champagne, not white star. It was like Don, uh, Don Perignon. And he was saying, you know, this is the best champagne we're going to have made in like 500 years that's coming out over these last three years. He's like, if you really want to like stash something for later, that's going to evaluate and it's going to give you something like a return both in flavor and, and cash and all that. He's like, buy cases now. And of course, that could be a sales pitch, but he's right in the sense that the weather that's going into it is producing exceptional grapes. You're getting exceptional wines. You're getting this exceptional year, and you can stick it someplace, and you can hold on to it, and it'll sit there, and it won't go bad. Well, my uh, Sometimes. My, my parents live in Lake County, California, and they, they uh, say some of the same thing that like these hard scrabble years um, are like yeah they're, they're best, um, yeah their their best yeah their their best years that like it's <clears throat> like almost like the year the like they they don't know if the weather was <laughs> the the you know the best conditions or whatnot right and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, some of these are their their, their best years that uh and and also factor who knows what's to come, right? Who knows what's to come? Right. We don't you know, like um you don't know if it's gonna be around or not. Yeah, sure. You know? And that's sure. kind of the thing. So, you know, the in a way to answer your question, the you know, the can you justify that price tag, that could be applied to any commodity. Do you really justify one point two million dollars for a war haul? Right. When he may or just had like one of his stooges printed up while oh, he was getting right. high with the Velvet Underground, who well, knows? But you're paying <clears throat> not necessarily. Are you paying just because it's a it's a good piece of art, which it may or may not be? You're paying for a representation in time and space, and the intersection of cultures and all these other things. So the artwork itself is more than the sum of its parts, and the I've, wine is the same way. I feel like a good example. Uh, I did. Uh, part of this dinner where a ship had sank coming from Portugal, like, I don't know, a couple hundred miles off, like, the Carolinas or something like that. And uh, I don't know if it was too or whatever. Somebody was finally able to, like, get down there, and, re- and there were cases and cases of wine. Oh, oh. And perfectly preserved. Perfectly preserved. Ideal and, conditions. No light, no temperature. And they, like, auctioned these bottles off, and there was a dinner. And, like, yeah, I mean, the bo- people were paying, like, this crazy amount of money. Yeah. And it's just, like, it's lit, like... Yeah, that's also it's, like it's, treasure, right? You're, exactly. It it's is sunken treasure. Tra- yeah. It was literally sunken yeah. treasure. Yeah. Right. right. You know? You know, to... So, to be clear, I know nothing about wine. 
nothing. And I just wanted to like draw like a comparison to like something I do know about, like knives right. or um, even like guitars, something like that. So like, those are actually very good. Those are very good comparisons. Yeah. Excellent comparisons. I mean, well, because I I, I, I get mean, the a, time. Str- a Stradivarian, like eh, okay, it sounds right, but they're not better? making any more of them. Exactly. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Like, okay. So I'm. So those are yeah. the things I'm starting to see because like. Yeah. When I think of like a knife, I might think of, and I maybe like the folding knives is even more than the, uh, like uh, chef knives themselves. Like you get into, you get into blade steels, right? You start with like blade steels, materials. It's got titanium on right. it. Does it have carbon fiber? Um, you know, you throw stainless steel out the window. You're looking for higher end materials, higher end blade steels. But then, then you start actually looking at the craftsmanship, right? And then beyond the craftsmanship. And maybe it comes before the craftsmanship is like who made it, because sometimes right. the name makes a difference, and the name for some reason holds water with some people. But then you you'll get a knife, or I'm talking about knives specifically, right. and it's got all kinds of issues. It's, there's a problem, but then if you just go to someone with you know quality craftsmanship, there must be like a craftsmanship to the winemaking. Well, there's as well. always. I mean, there's a there's certainly you know, and I think the name when you touch on like the the idea of the name. A lot of times, the cachet that comes with the name is because that original namesake had the craftsmanship. Okay. Right? So if you would go back to, like, I don't know, let's go back, like, 900 years in Japan, and you someone comes to you and they're like, hey, man, I've got this, like, 12, you know, 900 or 1,200-year-old Japanese sword. Right. You know, can you reproduce this? Most guys would be like, well, we kind of can. Like, we've got the technological know-how. We know what it's made out of. We, we could... You can reverse engineer it, but you can't really make the same thing. Right. What were you going to say? Well, I was saying in a... that case, I, I wonder, do we want to? Like, do we have techno? Like, in, yeah. in the case of, like, a knife, like, do we want to make something that's basically antiquated? Like, right. but, but some of those knives, you know you know, the mean? reason they're so good is because yeah. people took them into battle, and they're, yeah. like, they're banging up against other steel and rock and trees and bone, and they're not chipping, and they're yeah. not dulling. And they're there's I mean, you can lop off three hundred arms and just keep on lopping. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's bizarre my, because I see the My Trident, man, I, I can't lop it more than I can't I can't take the arms off more than two people with my wrist off before it like is going to Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I carry a that's why I carry a steel into battle with me. <laughs> yeah, well, wait a second, true. guys. I've got to like uh, got to hone my but, edge. You know, to draw like the direct contrast, like With a knife, it's functional, and, like, you can lop off somebody's arm if you wanted to or whatever you're going to do. A guitar, you can make a song. Right. You can make a recording. You can sell it. With a bottle of wine, you drink it. And and it's done. I mean... It's gone. True. It's it's very bizarre. True. To me. It's a consumable thing. But, I mean, this this is like, you know... Uh, the the hundred dollar burger you can get right. like cafe but oh I, but I there's foie gras and gold leaf all over <laughs> it ten and pounds like, of frog water right, hundred pounds of gold it's just gold like leaves. okay I yeah. mean we value things for all reasons, kinds of reasons we yeah. don't we can't fully explain so, certainly like yeah, you no. know the expensive burger is probably coming from a guy which in this case if you're talking about like that cat up and where is he like in Canada that dumps frog gras and everything. You know, that's like his shtick. And so people are paying for that. And they're, what they're doing is they're paying for the ingredients. Right. Not necessarily the craftsmanship, but really the ingredients. Right. But if, say, you take a guitar, I used to have, um, what I, I used to have a tailor. That fucking thing very, sucked. Very good guitars, I was that about to say. That thing was <laughs> terrible, man. Oh, wow, I wonder man, why. Man, it, it played like, it, it played like lead and fucking concrete mixed together <laughs> with rebar and, and and like like it well, packed into a satchel and Taylor's like full, full of stone <laughs> USA it was terrible. made what did it need to be set up did it ever get set up or anything I think it was just it was just one of those things where you know even like the best guitar companies every once in a while they just oh, knock they, out shitty there's guitars there's a dud yeah. yeah but you know the yeah. other thing about it yeah. is but it was like, a tailor and that's why I got it yeah no you buy the, the other thing the about it it's name. like okay there's a certain, uh, like, and I see this with, like, knives, with ingredients, guitar stuff. Like, 
this idea that like if I have the most expensive guitar, I'll rock. If I have Dude, the best yeah. knife, sure. I'll be it's, awesome. If I have sure. those shoes, I'll dunk a basketball. Sure. Especially it's like, if you go rock to, with a shitty guitar. If you can like, rock with a shitty guitar, it's yes. like don't give don't me like a tenderloin that. and be like, look how good it is. Like, oh, you did, you didn't do anything yeah. to it. Give me an ankle and an ear and show me <laughs> how good you can make that. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. kind of just like uh, it's like well, sure, everything that's awesome, it's easy. See, to sometimes <laughs> rock, the I more get, expensive like, stuff is like taken as the shortcut, to right? Success. Right, like, because it is easier to play like a really nice guitar, and a really good guitar player could have rocked my Taylor. It just been like, like it's like that scene in uh, in the Blues Brothers, and you got like Ray Charles sitting there, and he's like, "Man, there ain't nothing wrong with this piano," right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But for the ingredients, when you were saying that, that's so true. People can blow, you know, blow their wad on uh, just higher, higher end ingredients and expect success. All right, I gotta be on like in like I don't want to like demigrate my own uh, employment here, but like in Disclaimer. like steakhouses. It's okay, we're hiring ste- <laughs> steakhouses in general. Like I really don't, and I guess. The, the level of service like maybe that's the thing and people want to feel but like a steak is literally the one thing you could make at home right exactly like they do it and, and it will be one uh it'll be cooked however you want it mm-hmm. that's the, like and like i was saying, like what's the difference between this steak and what i make at home right. like about 60 bucks so i think we've touched on you're bringing up something that uh, it's actually touching on what we're talking about here, and I think what we're cluing in on here is is status. I, all these yeah, things, I suppose that is it. All these things, the expensive wine, the really nice guitar, status, the yeah. going to a steakhouse, all this stuff, I think really, I think we could boil it down to, to is, is the status. I've got really nice knives because it's, whether or not they're functional for what I do or if it makes me better, the status that people associate with this knife or with this name or with this or with the wine or the steakhouse is what people are going for. And people and also, love status. Well, also remember when we're talking about this, we're <laughs> talking to three people, you know, we're in, in the industry, you know. And we have no status. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not where I was going with that. <laughs> but I was saying that, like, you know how to cook a steak. I guarantee you, if you pulled uh, just a line of everybody in the steakhouse and asked them to cook a steak, you know, medium rare. I'm the pastry chef. I can cook a steak, which is but fine. You're, you're, I can't cook like chef. 50 of them with, with, all, with a bunch there's, of different temperatures. I don't no, know, no, man. No, you get out of a steakhouse. There's a bunch of like, a lot, especially in Texas, there's a lot of like good old boys in there who just pride themselves on running their, their queues in the backyard on the weekends. Fourth of July. And oh, they're, they're yeah. Shut down. I, that's a good point. I'm the steak that's master. That's a good point. Really what it comes down to is. But are they doing it medium rare? They could be the Yeah, steak, yeah. Those steak. guys are, I guarantee you. Like Some of them when are, we were yeah. talking our last last conversation we had, I was yeah. touching on how all of my all my friends that are hunters and fishermen have way better skills at like butchering their their quarry and it. cooking their quarry than a lot of the chefs I know, right? Because they're in it all the time. I think when you go to the steakhouse, half those people, if not more, of those people could probably knock out a perfectly good steak. And like. So that would, you know, that maybe would be they don't, status. Maybe they can't knock out fifty in like an evening, and maybe they don't have the patience to, or the the willingness to be on the hotline and do that. But they can do it on their own accord. Yeah. But what they're paying for is to go to that steakhouse and to have someone come up to their table with a little crummer and pull the breadcrumbs off the, off the linen and get a really good bottle of wine that. They can brag about like you know ha-ha, we opened up the open the Opus Magnum while we had our filet mignon and like yeah you had fucking Idaho potatoes deep fried in canola oil <laughs> so yeah. I bet that pairs great with the Opus One right, you know right. by the way <laughs> but yeah, yeah and, you know I mean not to to great the guys who are just yeah. going out to but status to is eat. huge you know steakhouses oh yeah are I status. agree I agree I think it's and, a good and point. you you brought this up on uh, your podcast that like um, these like peasant ingredients that like to people like us like are like oh my god like that to to be able to do that is like. You know, I guess status of the chef world. Oh, absolutely! Like, That's the measuring stick, right? Right. Of a good to be, chef. It's like, oh, my steak's like a yeah. steak is already good. You don't even do anything. Exactly like you said. Bring me an ear right. or an it's ankle. Like, 
Yeah. And I, we'll talk. And it's just like, okay, here's a pile of guts and some feet. <laughs> What are you going to do? Like, I'm going to grind up the feet and I'm going to shove them in the guts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, and it's going right. to be great. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, this guy, Will, I, w- I used to work with. or He worked with us, uh, and now he's up at a, uh, uh, he's at a barbecue joint up north called Oak something or other, Oak House or whatever it is. Oast House. Post House. Is that what it is? Oast House. Oast? I oh, I've On seen that place. Uh, I don't know where it's at, but it's like a it's a barbecue joint. I see. Oh no, Oast House is not a barbecue. Okay, this joint. is uh, oh, okay. Oast House, you've heard of. That's I the have. same owner as the district. He's uh, the the pastry chef of the district's been praised a couple of times. You might have heard his name, but Oast House District, same owners. Okay. But this is not what you're you, saying. Is yeah, something this is different. like a barbecue joint. But sorry for that. Um, you know, we were talking, and he was like, we were having the same conversation. Like, you know, anybody can put salt and pepper. On a grill, on a steak, and grill it up, and give it, give you a like a fillet. And if you buy like super prime, you know, fucking steak, wagyu beef, whatever, it's gonna be awesome. But, right. And he was saying the same thing. But what can you do with like kneecaps and tendons? And that's where you get into like awesome poor people food, right? And we okay. were talking about poor people food last time. We were. Yes. And since then, I've just started touching on the the Netflix episodes of Street Food, and I'm like, oh, yeah. I love this. Yeah. Yes. You know, you like, know oh, I really, sh- I was about to click that. Literally, do it, man. Other- it's fantastic. Ah, you know, I will. But like, you know, who, who in the United States that goes to like the CIA or out at like San Francisco to like you know the Art Institute or the Cordon Bleu or wherever or studies under Anton Mosimon in Sweden and is working in a castle, you know, and does all this stuff? How many of them actually know how to prepare? Tendon. Well, okay, so this right? this brings up a like that um, all the Vietnamese do. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's a, a different they, culture because that's all they got to eat. You know right, what I'm saying? Yeah. Like Th- this brings up something that like I've kind of had a problem with in like fine dining for years. So like I've worked in like you know the top end of just like absolute like untouchable weird fine dining, and the thing that really gets is like. Is it the goal to make this like totally unapproachable to people in general? And sometimes like, it is, and it's like, do you really think as well? I think so. I think sometimes people, especially chefs, I think it's like art. Um, people look at, and this is going to sound weird. So people look at it like a Picasso, and they they see the talent and they but they see the commercial value and then later artists are like they want to be a Picasso or whatever it is what they don't understand is he was trained in like sketch drawing and charcoal and he could he could draw a normal person he saw the world in a different way you know he didn't do something because it was going to be cool he did something because that's how he saw it van gogh saw the world in a different way these people see things in a different way Some chefs taste food and items in different ways, and they create these things and these structures that everyone is blown away by, and the people that come behind them try to emulate that and imitate that, and in doing so, they they say they're pushing the limits, but really, I think what they're doing is they're grasping at like random things at time kind of like you said the was like the wasabi mousse they're they're pulling these things together and they're trying to create something but it's not really coming from their, so, the way they view the food or the world it's but van gogh picasso see the world a certain way they saw the world differently like they like, see it see, they see it differently they so do you see think it differently in that time that they're thinking people will you know, right on my no coattails. One, no one liked Van Gogh. Everyone thought he was uh, right. Yeah, they were, uh, they were, they think they okay, were both when you were kind of, kind of, of, kind of crazy. Like, yeah. what is this guy doing? This guy was a jerk. So, and it could, right. He couldn't paint for shit. But when we're... <laughs> Look, it's all, it's, it's all splotchy. Yeah, yeah, it's all weird looking, but yeah. it turns exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's that's his, their story. And yeah. now, now you take uh, like a chef who has this restaurant and this menu that we look at and we go, why, the, why would we go there? Do you think that they're literally thinking like in a... Uh, Van Gogh esque way, where they're they're kind of blinded by their vision, or are they saying, "I'm going to go so far out here that two, two, three, four years, however, ten years, one decade, somebody's going to be trying this." You know, I would say that sometimes that w- sometimes it might be true that someone is so so in like encompassed in their vision that they ignore the world around them and they drive forward and if they're successful or they're not successful 
they don't care and they just keep pushing forward because they have that vision. Yeah. But I don't think that most modern chefs are that way because I'll be honest with you, and this comes from like a personal place, most, mo- I'm going to say 99.99% modern chefs do not have a comprehensive mastery of their own fucking craft. They don't have it. Escoffier was badass because Escoffier had a mastery of his craft. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at an Escoffier cookbook and he's talking about like, okay, I'm going to make... I'm going to make a stock for my, for my, the one of the like 1100 sauces that I can make. <laughs> like the stock, the stock that he's using is more complicated than anything on anybody's menu. Like he's got, you know, X amount of this and that and the other, and he's pulling all these things and he's worked all this out over his life. And then you take that and you're like, okay, well, how many sauces can the average chef make? And they're like, well, I know my mother's sauces. And I know a couple offshoots of each one of those, but they're not going well, anywhere you, near you, the capacity. You've got even a, even like a worse kind of um, like you know like th- that is like trickled down that like you've got these kids and going like oh I want to do uh, this like molecular gastronomy shit and it's like you don't know how to trust a chicken yeah or like you know and you don't even have like how to roast bones and you right, don't even you didn't even pass chemistry a, class how can you do Bo- yeah. How can you do molecular cooking if you can't pass chemistry? So you guys right. are both saying this because you said that came from a personal place, yeah. and then you said ninety nine point nine whatever yeah. percent Dude, of people. I, I am. But do no- you really think? Yeah, that's because that's a pretty. It's a bo- giant statement, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's why, why is that personal to you? Well, because I personally do, am not a master of my craft, right? I know from inside. You're humble enough to I, say I this. I know right. for a fact. Like if I were like, that's one of the beautiful things. Like when we were talking last time, it's one of the reasons I do stages every once in a while, and I go out and I meet other people and I talk to other people because I know I'm not a master of my craft, and I re- I can recognize one when I see one, right? But my. Uh, you agree, uh, basically, right? I yeah, mean, no, i You um, see it in other ways, so I'm just, it just, I, I don't know. I mean, and I, I there's got to be a staging thing. You know, I'm 43 years old, and like, I'm whatever, like, my, I, I'm doing what I'm doing, but like, if for anyone to not be like, oh, to not have the idea of like, I'd love to spend a day in their kitchen because like, it's just, it's, it, that's weird to me. It is like, weird. I would, I would love to have two months off to, to, to yeah, go, wouldn't that be great? Right. To go stage everywhere. Like, but dude, I hope both of you guys get some stashes in there. Come I hope cafe so too. And you, maybe, some dough. you know, maybe someone will hear this cast and they'll be like, Hey for man, sure. I want to bring Phil in and let him hang out and work for free. I'd be like, sure, man. You know, cause you can learn or the stuff. other way around or the yeah. other, or the yeah. other way around. Yeah. But the thing is, is that, those guys that we look up to, uh, it like, and we're t- I'm talking like in the Western tradition, like Auguste Escoffier, he was, that guy knew his craft so well, he predicted the next 100 years of cooking. He knew, at, like when he was on his way out, and I've got, <laughs> I've got a couple of his cookbooks, but uh, he knew on his way out, he was like, the world is done with rue. Like, He's like, we're going to move away from using butter and flour as thickeners. People are going to start doing what we're doing now, which is experimenting with reductions. We're going to thicken with reductions. We're going to move on to these new starches like cornstarch and potato starch. And it wasn't just because there was like these things were coming to the market and it was the technology was changing. It's because he knew what was going to happen. And the only way you know what's going to happen he is He also you, started in wartime. He did start in he, wartime. So I feel like... And in a weird war. And you know. he had to kind of like adapt to what... Sure. Y- yeah. But we're talking like, you know, like the eight, eight, late 1800s. So we're talking like Napoleonic Wars with like just the advent of like canned food, really. Like pasteurization. Yeah. Like well, that's why Napoleon yeah, was, right? able, was able to... But what I'm getting at is that the guy was so well-versed in what he knew that he had the capability of, of breaching, like breaking out because he understood what he was doing versus someone who doesn't understand where they're coming from mm-hmm. and what looks like them re- break, like reaching out into the future is just them like grasping at straws. Okay. You know, and sometimes, yeah. you know, but sometimes you do come across a guy who doesn't know anything about nothing or a gal and they turn out to be these amazing people with these totally unique perspectives because they're not burdened by the past and burdened by the traditions. Right. But those are rare, rare gems. I'd like to bring something up that um, you say, like, burdened by the past and burdened of traditions. Um, so so my father's from Holland, um, 
you know, I've been to visit the family and whatnot. I staged at La Rive there in Amsterdam. <clears throat> but I have to say that I one of the things that I really love about um, the foods in America is that we don't have any traditions. We do not. And that also, at some point, like, doesn't limit us in any way. Oh, it doesn't. And be, because I think about, like, something like, you know, if you... <laughs> Go to like some like in Italy, like oh man, this right. Parmesan. How long you guys would like? Cool, I want to make some ice cream out of this Parmesan. Like, you spit in my father's <laughs> grave. Like what are you talking about? And it's like, it's like I don't, I don't care about your tradition. Well, true man. that. I want to like just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you know, you guys, like, we don't have traditions. Exactly, we're too, that's well, what we're I'm saying. Young, like though. I'm it's, going like. There's nothing holding me. There's nothing sacred in in food to me that like I'm not gonna try. You know what I mean? And maybe it doesn't work. Fair enough. Right. But like, but I'm I'm not gonna like not try it because think, there's something. I that, think what I'm getting at is that you know, I'm not saying people shouldn't try things and people should always be adventurous. But I think that when people are trying things simply because. When people are, it's like reinventing the wheel. When someone's trying to do something simply because they can, it doesn't always work out. But if you know where you're coming from, then sometimes you can anticipate the failures and you can just bypass them. And if someone goes, you know, like, like why wouldn't Parmesan ice cream be good? I mean, it is good. Of course it is. We like, you like heavy cream and Parmesan, right? (laughs) Right, right. I mean, it's just a cold sauce. Cold sauce is fine. Frozen sauce is probably better. So frozen sauce. Great. Those combinations are already there. Now, someone may go, oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, cold Parmesan cream sauce. Sure. Okay, I can see why that could go towards ice cream. But if someone doesn't know and they're like, and they're oblivious to like how things are and they just start throwing things together. Oh, right. It's, just I get, kind of blind, yeah, yeah. it's like blind luck. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Cause like I'm looking at this, this like, okay, custard is custard. There's a fat, like yeah. there's a fat ratio, like, duh, 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 you know. But <clears throat> yeah, doing it that way. But like, I'm very like concerned and slightly put off. I don't, whatever. I don't want to bag on people's like traditions or whatever, but put off about like, oh, you can't do that. My my father's well, been making. You know, sure. I want to do the, like sure. to, 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 to to is to like. Well, how old, how long have you. we been over here in the U.S. compared to Italy or wherever these traditions not, were? So we're let's just. I'm just saying this. You fast forward to the United States of America, five, six, seven hundred, eight, eight hundred, a thousand years from now, right? We are making traditions. Yeah. There will be traditions. There just aren't traditions that Hamburgers we know. Hamburgers will of. only have mustard and pickles. <laughs> some, well, weird, that's some, what it's, some something weird like, like that. But like, it, it may that also be. Yes, but you know, it may also be this thing like, where we're gonna we're gonna mayonnaise. do the different thing. <laughs> the you know, hot the, dog, <laughs> national food of America. I'm just like, well, what traditions are we making? We're, man? We're, um, it's like a baby with the tradition, the hot right. dog. But like, if you look, you fast forward, right. our tradition may uh, uh, obviously it will evolve, but it may be like to reach outside the box and try the. You know, infuse these two things. Standard. You you don't so, you ever try and I do just, something simple. I, I love the idea of like living in a melting pot, like and especially in a like um, you know, in in the culinary sense that like America is the melting pot culinarily. We have right. You know, we have Austin. French traditions. Hey. We have English traditions. We have uh, indigenous traditions. We have all these things coming together. And I think that the traditions themselves should never hold people back. But what I'm talking about isn't like the traditions in the sense of like, okay, this is how you make Parmesan. If you do anything other than parm- other than scrape it off on a piece of pasta, you're you're messing with my father's memory. I'm talking about the traditions of of people who take the time to study and learn their craft. So, for example, I know a guy who makes guitars, right? I don't know who he learned from or how he learned, and he makes halfway decent guitars. 
But there's a tradition in the luthier world where you study with someone, so you learn how yes. to pick the woods yeah. out. You learn what woods resonate in what L- way, little how plug they combine. Here. Chef, Chef Kurt on Wednesday coming then, up the 22nd, he's, he was a l- former luthier, and he's a so chef now. you learn those ways. Masonry is the same way. This used to be... This used to be, be our the, way. The, yes. This, right? like, my, my father and uncles... They were apprentice yes. butchers, like, and then you learn the traditions and the craft, yeah. and you can move beyond the traditions. But the thing is, is that it's not moving beyond the traditions because the traditions are useless. It's moving beyond the traditions because you have the the knowledge and the foundation of that knowledge mm-hmm. that allows you to break free and maybe respect and understand and like, understand. Yeah, and like you know, like it's one of the challenges. And this is a, here's a really hard thing to do. Someone gives you a plate of food and then they make you like reverse engineer that. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. First of all, you have to have an exceptional palate. Every time I go to a restaurant, I can't help doing this. Right? <laughs> but you got to like, but it's a hard thing to do. And sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong. It's like reverse engineering anything. But the only way that I think that you can, like you personally, when you go to a restaurant and you try to reverse engineer something is because you have an understanding of the knowledge and the knowledge in the memory banks of your brain that allow you to access the stuff that to give you the clues to lead you back to where it came from. If you don't have that knowledge, then you're just like, oh, hmm, I wonder how they did this. And then you're, again, you're just like floundering. But yes. I don't think the traditions are there to, I don't think we should be limited by our traditions, but I think we should respect the, the knowledge traditions in our craft enough to be like, hey, I should understand why and how something does something before I decide that I'm not going to do it that way and just go do something else. Because you Well, know, this is one of the... Um, so I went to pastry school just because I didn't know... Like, I felt like I didn't know enough about it. And you wanted to work in the morning. And I didn't want to work. I, I, <laughs> and it I, turns out you knew it all. I didn't <laughs> You're like, what are they teaching the me here? <laughs> and the other thing is, like, I, I'm too, I can't learn another way to cut an onion. You know what I mean? Like, right. I'm already, like, midway through my 20s. Like, there's a certain thing that... Um, oh. But weirdly enough, you know, like... <laughs> Uh, pastry, the the pastry is like literally like indicative of like all food science. Like, um, sure enough, like a lot of the like, uh, you know, so it's like you know, you're letting bread rest. This is a thing for all for all protein, right? You, you know what I right. mean? Like, you, you, you have, let steaks you rest. Have to you let, let bread it rest. rest. You let eggs rest. You let mm. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so and it I took like me. Yeah, and it, yeah. like uh, I, I didn't realize that going in, but uh, something a light bulb went off at a certain point that like it's like okay, this is quite indicative of food science in general. Wow, that is interesting. I've never heard a direct comparison to like protein and bread, or you know. It's I mean, a, that's a mixing when you're mixing, you're developing protein strands. Oh, that's um, crazy. Yeah. You know, and depending on, like, how you... And this kind of goes into knowing your craft. Like, personally, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. There are a lot of guys out there who have better palates than me. There are guys out there that have better technical skills than I do. There are a lot of guys that are, and gals out there that have better, uh, well, I would say, compositional skills when it comes to color and plating and all that stuff. But one of the things... I've always prided my proud, you know, been proud of and prided myself on was I never limited myself to being like a steak guy or a fish guy or I was a chef and I'm not a pastry chef or I was a pastry chef and I didn't make noodles or any of this stuff. So push come to shove, like when I work in Alaska, man, I can make fucking cannolis. Right. You know, I know how to make a cannoli. I've got a I've got a decent Italian like pastry recipe that I picked up along the way that is super universal for doing all kinds of amazing things. And the only reason I know that it's universal for all kinds of amazing things is because I have a knowledge of all these other things that I can see the commonality in. There's a, there's a common denominator in there. So like with the protein thing, you know, I understand the enough to make me look really talented but it's only because I have an under, like a foundational knowledge. So I can make really good bread. Like I'm a heck of a baker, believe it or not. And I very rarely bake, 
but I know what happens when you. But let, you know, you know what it requires. I know what like, it does. What signs to yeah. like? Yeah, yeah. I know I was, what happens when the bread rests once, and I know the difference between what happens when it rests twice. You know, and sometimes when you use a yeast as a leavening and you don't let it rest at all, and you're just making like poor, like a like a white guy's version of matzah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which matzah is uh, matzah is a white guy's version. Of it, it really is. I feel like last uh, last holiday I was like, oh, we got some matzah ball mix, and I opened it up, and uh, I was like, man, you only get two packages. My wife was like, wow, what a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Fuck you, lady. I'm married to. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's funny. Yeah. Rolling, rolling, right. rolling. So, gardening America is gardening. it trashy or is it uh, <laughs> is, is it forward thinking? Um, so, what I was saying was that my grandparents had a victory garden, and because we were talking about you know you have a garden downstairs, and he was talking about like working up in Nantucket during the break and how uh, golf clap. I have a garden downstairs. That's golf fine. clap. Right? And I think you motivated me. And, last you know, episode. and he was talking about how, like you know where. You know, the kids at the school could get involved, and they would have, like, lunch coming out of the garden and stuff. And I was talking about my daughter's school garden. And so where what I was saying was that, you know, like my grandparents, I'm 46, you're 43, you're 22. 37. 37. <laughs> uh, my grandparents, you know, during the Second World War, they had a garden. They had a victory garden. And so they planted tomatoes and they planted green beans and they planted blackberries and like raspberries. And some of that stuff they kept after the war. So like for me, some of my earliest fondest memories was sitting on the swing under the black walnut tree with the hand crank ice cream machine going with my grandpa and you'd swing and crank to the rhythm of the of the swing. That's cool. And you'd make fresh vanilla ice cream and go to the berry plant. You'd pull out fresh blackberries and you'd have fresh blackberries and fresh cracked walnuts and it was all beautiful. But it was all because during the war there was a, a shortage of food. And then after the war Nobody had a victory garden because now you had this huge military industrial complex that was feeding the soldiers and canning the food and they had to do something with it. And then they were like, we'll have grocery stores and we'll sell it. And now it became a matter of convenience and status that if you could go to the grocery store, like no more did people have a garden because well, you, and like, you could go to the like, grocery store and it was a sign of status and well to do to like put on your your little dress and get to your go to your cart and push your cart around the grocery store and buy your food because and you were plus successful. a lot of this came for like uh, you know like yes convenience of like why spend all day cooking when we've got a, ca- a ham and a can right but like, I really think like, like know, there was I'm, an innocence to like thinking that this be you know you wouldn't need to go anywhere anymore right. for food but like i really the, this what you guys are talking about is so interesting how we are like retracting all the right w- where we went with all that and we're like but yeah you, but now there's gmos everywhere you turn right. and we're kind of like the garden and the well, the thing that's interesting to me, so with all of our, like, farm-to-table thing, and we've got businesses called farm-to-table. This table, is podcast to like, chef-to-table um, to audience. <laughs> you know, like, uh, the farmer's markets and whatnot. I, I realize in San Francisco, I'm, like, going to a farmer's market. We're talking, you know, downtown San Francisco. And I'm seeing these, like, trucks from these farms, and I'm thinking, like, if we're really... I guess out to, like, if the carbon footprint is one of the things we're going for, like, these are the most efficient trucks coming from a farm that who knows where. Like, I got to say, man, like, HEB or somebody, they've got somebody that has, like, absolutely streamlined where things get picked up. Sure. How, you know, so... It's not a 67 flatbed Ford with a ex- bad muffler ex- driving ex- down exa- to the market. Exactly, you know, so, like, if the car... But, like... And, like, you know, if that's the real issue, the, like, the fuel consumption and um, plus, man, you know, the international shipping industry has got it down pretty well. I'm not saying it's completely, but, like, right. to, to say this kind of, like, farm-to-table local is, like, a magic bullet for, like, whatever it's like. 
Industries have probably shaved off every kind of uh, they're very conceivable. cost effective. Yes, you very know what I mean, effective. like because they're profit driven, right, right? Right, you know. And so that profit drive is it ties into what I was saying because, like, during the fifties, it was absolutely marketed as you know the successful happy homemaker went to Safeway and bought her food there, and she went to the grocery store, and she wasn't going out back and like and like boiling a chicken and pulling its feathers off. That was an inconvenience, and it was messy, and at this point, it wasn't a sign of being a, a middle-class American. It was a sign of being a lower-class American, and certainly right. not an upper-class American. And now when you're doing it, you're like, hey, look, that's on my Instagram. Yeah. Aren't, aren't we so crazy? The only people butchering their own chickens now are <laughs> like snooty upper-class Americans, yeah. <laughs> imitating <laughs> the middle-class Americans of the 50 who were trying to get away from being the fi- you know the poor guys in like <clears> the early 1900s. <throat> But interestingly enough, like you say, the shipping industry, I don't think a lot of people know or recognize or have even to, like even look to see where the spent grease goes in the grease trap. A lot of that spent oil from the fryers and all that shit you dump in the back of the restaurant and gets sucked up by the liquid waste solutions guys and it smells god awful and it gets trucked away. It all gets rendered and it gets turned into low grade diesel fuel yeah. for the international <laughs> shipping industry. So. Oddly enough, the Uber byproduct of like McDonald's, the, all that crappy grease and that industrialized world is actually offsetting the use of natural petroleum. Yeah, and I gotta wonder, <laughs> like, is that even like that, it's mind boggling? That right, case yeah. of apples that comes from, uh, you know, who, well, let's say it's the other side of the world. Let's say it's uh, those Fuji apples. Yeah, yeah, let's say that, like, <laughs> that literally has come and, like, the whatever company has, like, shaved every single, you know, scent off of their shipping and try, is, like, better than, like, those ones that came from, like, that that shitty truck in yeah. San Antonio. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, you're driving like, that, same old, that same old jalopy, 900 right. miles, you're getting, like, 17 miles the gallon. Yeah, but, I've got to wonder about but that. But the modern, but the modern like semi is getting like forty because it's got a computer assisted drive mechanism. Right. And all. But I like, think, no, no, no. It's low. It's like okay. Oh, it's I think great the, that it's low. I think the silver is it bullet. Better? The silver bullet. I think for all that stuff is a return to the is a return to the victory garden. It's a return to where individuals. Uh, and there's kind of a movement happening the last decade or so in the United States where individuals and, and communities grow. And I'm not talking like community gardens where everyone gets together and they're like, oh, you know, I got a community garden. But I'm talking like a community garden in the sense where entire neighborhoods take plots and they share the harvest and you're not going to the grocery store. And, of course, the grocery guys, are gonna, they're not going to want to hear this because there's a huge amount of money that's there tied is. into our grocery yeah, system. Yeah, but there's no grocery store guy. It's a... Huge monstrosity. Yeah, it's like a bunch of bunch of things. Yeah, yeah. there's not a guy. There's you not talk that to. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sitting you know. in his throne right now. No. Like, God, but you know damn what I mean. It. Like, right. like your your local your local independent like your local IGA your independent grocer association guy. He doesn't want you to be growing tomatoes. Because if you grow tomatoes in your house, you're not coming to his IGA. You're not going to Safeway. You're not going to Price Chopper. You're not going to yeah. Piggly Wiggly. You're not going to whatever the local chain. But when you, know. you consider that, like, that's – so, like, that's work. Like, so a uh, good friend of mine, Leah, she's uh, the farm at um, Urban Roots Farm. Right. You know, and it's like, okay, so – you have a, you know, you got a garden and whatever, like oh, me and my work. wife, we, well, and, and, you know, and that's the thing. It's like, oh, everyone do that, but like, that's a job. It is a job. You know what I mean? So like, it's one thing to say, like, and I've, I, you know, I, I'm the first person who's like, oh, you don't like the industrial food, come <laughs> grow a garden. But it's not to say, like, grow a garden. Like, if you really want a garden that does, like, you're at that garden. It's very you, difficult. Yes. You know it takes I mean? time. Like, it takes knowledge and all these right, things. Right. Like, yeah. It's almost, it's, it's a little sad of how off track people got. Right. In, in a way. And, and what's interesting is that this knowledge, this loss, it, essentially it's like a lost knowledge now, is something that's that. That's what's so sad. Is something that, like. It changed our history as the human species some 5,000 years ago. Like, we went from hunter-gatherer 
to like going, oh, you know what? I can actually like raise this weird grass and year now round, and I can like grind it and mill it. Right. And I can like mix it with a liquid and then bake it on a hot stone. The next thing you know, I got fucking street tacos. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, hey, yeah. you know, I, I mean, yeah, it's like agrarian society literally took us out of like tribal yeah. life. You know, we still behaved like tribalists, but, <laughs> you know, we weren't living like tribalists. Right. But I think, I really do think the, the silver bullet is... I, I love what you said. Yeah. Is people... Because, like, the last couple of years, there was a... There's a guy... Where is he? I want to say he's in Detroit, where he picked up a, a couple plots of, like, you know, shady land that had been, like, you know, a bit condemned or whatever... I think it's Detroit. I could have this totally wrong. But anyway, what they would do is... If it's a couple of plots, it's probably Detroit. It's probably, it's probably Detroit. <laughs> right. Anyway, so he grows this garden, and the deal is is that, like, if it's... I, I say like as my terrible, like, college student vernacular, but it's not like it at all. It's absolute. If you come into the garden, you can take whatever you want out of it. If there's peaches growing, you grab a peach. If you're hungry, you grab a watermelon. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And the only thing that I can think of that's even close to that is that is the experience in Germany where people still have a garden plots. You have these communities that have been around for, I don't know, some of these towns are like, you know, 1,400 years old. You know, they were settled during, by the Romans as they conquered Germania. And the original, the original inhabitants are still living in the building that was built at like 900. And these small, these small. So they all share the food. So these small towns, they all have a gardens plots. And you go, and these are like literally like a, like a 10 by 10 or a 20 by 20 square foot area for each family just outside of like the main wall. And they're all sharing the space. And they've been maintaining this garden for like nine hundred years. But you've got to build this into into culture too. Like you have to because our culture doesn't accept that. it. No, yeah. and that's that's the thing. Like so, I our saw our idea is package water and sell it. Yeah, so dude, pack it like. Like, how did it ever get to the point that bottle the you water bought off. bottled water yeah. as opposed to just using the water fountain? Like, because you the, couldn't trust me to water. What's the difference between this water and the tap? Like, about two bucks. Two bucks. <laughs> about two bucks. And a, and a non-BPA-free plastic yeah. container that's yeah. going to end up in a whirlpool out in the Pacific Ocean killing a dolphin. That's well, great. so have Go you seen in New Orleans, like, um, there's a couple, and I can't think, I don't know enough about New Orleans to... Um, of what the neighborhoods, I know a couple of them, but like, we're like, uh, go like Vietnamese neighborhoods where like they have like the uh, alley through the back, you know what I mean, where the sure, property sure. lines that are all giant ass gardens. Yeah. 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 And like, I'm just like, okay, so like, because like, <sighs> That's cultural to them. Like they're totally. You know that's what, what they mean? do. Like, yeah, and it's just like I don't know how or what it's gonna take to kind of sell this to our like generalized American culture. I think culture. he hit it on like, the. I think he hit it on the nose. Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. What kind of status can you get? How can you brag to your friends about like, so. oh, look at me, likes? Turn, it's I, all about right. the likes. I turn my back alley into like a like a garden. I live holistically. Yeah. Oh, well, for the uh, for the, the specific moment, it probably is something yeah. like that. But it's um, when you say silver bullet, I can't help but, because my mind is racing about how that's not like today. That's like that's something maybe not even our lifetime to be it, realistic. You know, it, it probably isn't today, and it probably isn't something. But in well, our there's lifetime. a move. You said there's a movement, and when I say not in our lifetime, as far as being a silver bullet, this is something that puts like what we're currently there's, seeing to I a mean, stop. There's definitely a move. I mean, people are actually talking. About, I mean, we're talking about it. Like, yeah. But we might have been the people that were talking about it like 20 years ago. But, Which we are. Yeah, but like the, but the it's thing such is a that small it's, stamp in the big, the the grand scheme of things. That it's that it's coming up. Like it's, it has the potential because you know. So like Alice, everyone knows who Alice Waters. Not everyone is, but but most people in like the slow food movement. You know who Alice Water is as a chef and a restaurateur, and everyone's like, okay, she's like the godmother, the godmother of developing re- local relations 
with local producers to bring fresh and local organic vegetables. But newsflash, like everywhere, like that have we been have, happening for a thousand yeah, years. Yeah, that we have this like I want to eat seasonal and local. It's like that's everywhere else in the world. Yeah. yeah. And by like, the way, you can't get seasonal in the Midwest because it's winter. Come, come, come. So if you want to eat local, you're getting yeah. like preserved deer jerky well, and yeah. a root tuber of some sort. So yeah, that, that you, might you, scare you, you off. Canned, from what? You canned <laughs> you whatever canned you could. From the summer, yeah. Like. So that that gets, goes to show what yeah. America's tradition a, yeah. is becoming. So, a, something our, bizarre. Our our idea of eating local and seasonal is based on having whatever we want when we want it during whatever time of the year it is. It's and it's also accessibility. Like, I'm sorry if you're eating <clears throat> if you're eating like a caprese salad with a fresh, beautiful tomato and mozzarella and fresh basil and a drizzle of awesome olive oil and maybe a balsamic reduction or whatever the hell you're having in January, man, that you, you had better be someplace where it's warm like Italy because it doesn't grow in Minnesota in January. It doesn't grow in New York State in January. It's, not, it's certainly not in Manitoba. It's eye-opening, man. You know, it's not Just Ohio. Say, say it's that, not man. Iowa. It's, our idea of seasonal is, a, is an absurdity. Real seasonal food, like, like here in Texas, if you look at like seasonal foods, it, you'd be eating nothing in the <laughs> Just summer. Just no Paul. It's <laughs> nothing but no Paul. You would eat nothing in the summer. <laughs> You're like, do I? And it's all the like prickly, <laughs> like hard totally. no Paul. It's not even the all like. day long. You're like, maybe there's a scrawny goat out there that has survived the, the the heat. But we have this like we have this stupid version in our heads. And the and the people that come to the restaurants are like, oh, I eat seasonal. You're like, no, you don't. What you eat <laughs> is what's available from all over the world coming to you. Right. So yeah. when I say it's a silver bullet, I I know there's something happening because. There is now like odd little apps that people that you can log on to. I forget what there was one I saw. It's like um oh, throw it it's out like there. a garden share app. I forget what it's called. But basically people who have home gardens can join this group and they can swap their mm. produce. So it's, you know, in this in this world of the gig economy and the share economy and whatever, instead of like sharing jobs or sharing clothes or whatever it is, they're sharing food. You can sign up and you can say, okay, look, I've got this bumper crop of like awesome tomatoes, but you know what? My beans didn't turn out and all my squash has like... It has like squash bugs and there's nothing there. Somebody else is like, oh man, I'm gonna, I, grew, I got all this squash. My tomatoes just fucking burned out. I got nothing. What am I going to do? So you can, you can swap with these people. That's great. It's a really, really great idea. The only thing that inhibits it is the fact that nobody does their own gardening. Well, right. For those of us who do garden, it's almost ahead of its time. It is ahead of its time. So for those of us who do garden, but in a way, in a weird way, it's a technological answer. And it's an opportunity for people who are looking for this. A silver bullet. A looking for a, a, yeah. an, an entryway to get into doing something, right? But it requires you being a gardener. It requires you going out and getting dirty. And, and yeah, but I mean in the age of eat? like, uh, honestly, okay, so. But dirty fingers? Who has dirty nails? Well, but, but, but we're Is that looking, where you're going with that? We're looking into more like, I mean, my wife could like, I mean, she, you know, like she have more like work from home type right. stuff, you know. I mean, like we're, we're getting into a a thing of like well, there's less like coal mining, <laughs> you know. Less what coal I mean? mining, yes. and you know what I mean. Like, it's like oh, I can go out and like you know, kind of water the garden at a, in the middle of the but, day, like. But for real, when was the last time you went to like a PTA meeting or you went out to like say the W and you walked in and all these damsels were sitting around with dirt under their nails? Yeah, well, because I it, also not, I also I didn't, go mar- I didn't marry them, either. right? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I'm saying. <laughs> is is like for the most part the the people who really for the most part people are interested in emulating status and this is going to come back to status we love the status Dude, and we don't want to we don't want to do these things that make us look poor but the thing is is if if we can get past the concept that somehow living off the land 
is a sign of poverty, then we have a future. I we think, can. We I can. think there's. I think that's a um, a movement that's going forward. Maybe I just hang out with a different crowd, but we look like we hang out we with the do. same crowd. We're not wearing shoes and we have tattoos. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> But like, no, you, but you. I mean, you you see this like you know people. There's like a revolution and I, I, I I'm I'm very um, if you I'm came very to my optimistic. House, I'm I, very optimistic. We talked about this before the show. If you came to my house, I would literally make U.S. cargo from the snails that are in my garden. Oh yeah, yeah no, they're I'm, ready to go. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, right? I feel like the same way. Yeah, yeah. Steiner Ranch gals. Not eating it. No, no, but, but if I charge him four hundred dollars, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can get away with it, right? Yeah, you know, and I pair it with a nice, like, super expensive white wine and some kind of like, you know, some other bullshit a presentation. Man. I, I'm optimistic that things are. Um, no, I'll put it in a really terrible, turn. terrible plastic bowl. And it'll be kitschy, and they'll love it. Oh yeah. Well, still, it's a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at me! I'm in touch with nature and the world yeah. with my nine hundred dollar <laughs> manicure. Right. Well, like, so I live not too far from um, House Bar Farm, and like, I write, you know, I was like, I see a lot of doing like farm tours, which is it's cool. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like maybe one of the th- that's so perfect is like no one's ever seen a farm. <laughs> like, Not surprising. Y- you know what I mean? Like I, I feel like that's a like in whatever. I'll go on the tour. Like I, I love you know I it's love because the there's like dirt and there's bugs. Well, and it's, it's like bouncing around in my head that it we're almost like uh, I don't know what the word is, but like I, I mean I I don't mean retarded in the sense like. You know, like in a derogatory, but like we, like people don't understand how to survive anymore. We are one hundred percent disconnected from the natural may, world. May, okay, disconnected, We're but I disconnected. mean, like really, if you threw somebody out there and said, "Here's a bag of seeds," which you wouldn't even have the luxury to have anyway, you know, and here they probably sh- feed them to the birds. Right, right. I'm the just pigeons. saying it's, it's <laughs> not even the good birds. And not even try to catch one. <laughs> You're right. Oh shit, they flew away. They should have tried to catch one when they were here. And then my myself, Swab. I'll go digging in, in the garden. Just we did that the other day and yeah. like so subconsciously I remember looking at my nails when I was out doing stuff like just caked in dirt. I'm like I don't you know, I'm just a I guy. call my nails the reverse French manicure is that they're <laughs> always black underneath and white on the <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, sometimes yeah. you're we're around these people who are so like sterile that uh, there know. there's a there's a, a, a full disconnect uh, and here's how I know when I when I went overseas a number of years ago a friend of mine was living in Germany and it was amazing they, his little town was like built it was like you know set up in like in the 1400s and we decided to go down to the Matterhorn and so we drove down to Zermatt and you can't take a car there but we did and so we got this giant fucking ticket and so we drove back and we had to take the we had to take the train and all this stuff but on the way back there was this restaurant I wanted to go to I didn't have the opportunity or the time but it's one of those places where it's on like the banks of the Rhine and the guy raises his own ducks and races ducks. He's got fragua, but mm. it's only oh races. races. I thought you said races. <laughs> no, it didn't race the ducks. Like, but maybe he does race the ducks. I mean, you got to have a good time, right? Uh, yeah. So he raises, you know, his own ducks and geese, and he has like fragua, but it's only during a certain period of time in the year, because fragua is a is a specialty, you know, like like you you don't have fragua year round. It's just until it becomes an industry, right? That's but how foie gras, we can go. I, I I work with a lot of foie gras. It lasts. Right. It's but, literally it's, right. it, it lasts but, like butter. But we're like, an industry now, so that you can people create foie gras. Oh year right. Round. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. But realistically, you know, you don't do that because sometimes you want to eat the geese before you know what I mean. Like, and honestly, like you're doing like, oh well, I only feed them chestnuts, man. Chestnuts don't exactly grow everywhere, right? And they only grow seasonally, and there's a limited amount. And so this guy's doing all this stuff, and he's pulling fish out of the the river that he's serving, and of course, it's like you know, it had a a star or two on the Michelin guide, and it was very expensive right. because he, because the only way 
he could do, he could be connected to the, his world was to charge these people at these exorbitant prices. And honestly, the only people who wanted to go there were the people who could afford to go there and who wanted to have, like, the bragging rights of having gone there. Right. When mm-hmm. in reality, what he is doing is is just something that was done 400 years earlier out of necessity. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and like... That traces it back to, like, the peasant food. That, it is. Uh, this you know, whole like, conversation started from that. Like, there's just this disconnect between us and our and our world, and our natural world. And because of that, we have, all, we have a lot of these issues. You know, if we... I if, really if we, think when we say we, we have to clarify, we're... In Texas, the human this is, population. Well, human population, <laughs> but like I don't yeah. think it's a, as as a prevalent a problem as it is like in Europe or other parts of the the it's, world. It's less prevalent because you know what they've gone through. They've gone through all the growing pains. I maybe and they've I mean, figured it I out. I mean, it depends. On like where, you, uh, like where in Europe? But they've well, gone and like brains. where you know, where I mean, Christ, if you if you live in London, like you've. Maybe you've there's never no seen trees. a cow. Yeah. Like, I there's don't no, know. There's you no, know what I mean? Like, right. They well, used to have, got, like... Okay. Right. Yeah. So, like, right. We've got pockets, but we've right. got, like, the major. I really think that we're in the minority You know for what's this bizarre? So uh, we went to Montreal uh, a couple summers ago. We thought, like, oh, we'll take a trip. And it turns out Montreal is having their, the biggest heat wave. And then, uh, <laughs> so they're like, yeah, I guess we didn't escape much. But anyway... I ate horse like a couple different times. We went oh, to yeah. Joe Beef. Very I common. Had, I had like this awesome like Joe whole... Beef. I've heard I've heard great things about. Yeah, that, that place is great. Um, we had like ho- I had this horse tartare. I had some horse steaks. A couple of plates. I smuggled some back. But weirdly <laughs> enough, it's like lovely. <laughs> We like we we don't eat we don't eat we don't eat horse we have all the horses it's illegal yeah 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 like it's illegal to eat horse America has like most of the horses yeah. that exist so why don't we eat them uh, because uh, my grandfather his grandfather was a cowboy and the horse was his best friend the but, horse the horse is viewed as more valuable. As a transportation and a work animal, still, still, but we power. feed we feed them to zoo but tigers we feed them to dogs. and like yeah yeah yeah, like. right. but only mustangs. <laughs> <laughs> you can butcher the mustangs all you want because they're wild. They're not like thoroughbreds. But you, the the horse was seen as like a like a work animal, so you don't you don't eat them. And if you did eat them, it was seen as a sign of poverty. It really was. It's like eating cow is a sign of being rich. Eating horses is a sign of being p- poor. Goat herders were looked down upon in the United States because goat herders are old country poor people food. Yeah, cows are new world rich people food. Right. All right. So having having said that, like, and, and I've I, I've really like thought about this. Like, okay, so we in America we just want to eat like the wrong shit, right? So like a, a cow is. Probably the most unsustainable and eating Absolutely. animal. Where a goat and a pig can literally live anywhere and eat anything. anything. Yeah. Um, but like, well, pigs. It's not like we, uh, you know, we love pigs, but uh, their produce, their overproduction is bizarre. But a goat, like you ask, like. Hell, eighty percent of Americans say, "Hey, want to eat a goat?" They're like, "A goat?" Seriously, some, <laughs> of that, some of that isn't even about like, you know, the financial status of your life, like rich and poor. Some of it is just a matter of like, I don't want to be like my neighbor and othering. One of the universal commons, like universals in, in anthropology, is this idea of othering. We we take us versus them. Man, Pink Floyd wrote a great song about it, you know. And it's true. So sometimes entire cultures cultures will simply do something or not do something depending on what their neighbor does or doesn't do. So, you know, for the United States, you know, we if you look at who settled the United States, the eastern coast was settled by the English. And then you had the Mississippi Valley that was that was all French. And then you had Florida and the southern United States up to the west coast, the western United States, those are all Spanish. All those, all those kingdoms, they fucking hated each other, and they had competing ideas 
and competing agendas, and they were all based on what the other one was doing and not doing, and they didn't want to be the same. And so you had this constant conflict. And I think that translates to today. Like, why do Americans have issues with Spanish-speaking cultures? It's because we come from a place where we're like, yeah, we defeated the Spanish Armada in 1512 or whatever it was, right? Right. Because that's just where we are. That's the English, that's the hangover of the English agenda that still prevails. If you're in the Midwest of America, like if you're in Missouri, there's a place called Versailles. It's spelled V-E-R-S-A-I-L-L-E-S. 300 years ago, it wasn't Versailles. It was Versailles. Now it's Versailles because it's no longer French. It's now it's now American, and we don't want to be identified with the French. But if you're there's all these competing ideas. So the goat herders who came over here were competing not only with with the the ranchers for the land that that was being used, but they're also competing with these antagonistic ideas and these remnant traditions that just pervade the time space. And we still haven't gotten past it. And we don't get it. You know, we don't understand. But you can raise. Like you're saying, goats and pigs and all this really terrible scrub brush and be fine, man. Anywhere in the world the only thing on the, almost nothing. anything. Yeah. The, the hardest thing about a goat is keeping it from eating the paint off your house. Okay, no, so here, <laughs> here's the thing about a goat if you have a garden. Or if you like want it to like... You got to shoot the goat. You, you want it to like the other. maintain the yard. It's you, like, you yes. Eat it will eat all... It'll eat the poison ivy. It will yeah, eat it the will, poison ivy. But it's going to eat the roses first because yeah. they're delicious and yeah. next to your tomato. Like, yeah. So like, but why have who needs to have roses anyway? There, you don't do anything with them except well, for maybe make rose water if you're like into like awesome like Arabian desserts. But other basically, than that, it'll eat what you want, the things exactly. you want. <laughs> because it's like, hey, I'm a goat. I'm not stupid though. Like, yeah, oh, is that I'll eat like, all. Yeah, I'll eat the bark at the end when I've run out of everything else to eat. You but know? we've got all <laughs> these, like, we've got all this cultural baggage and these attitudes that we're not even aware of that keep us. Us, to me, they keep us from being free in the food world. Like the cow, for example. I had this. Uh, I learned this. This is a really something amazing that I came across in an English class of all places. We were talking about the idea of gratis and of in in English literature and all this stuff. And one of the things that the professor it's it's probably the only thing I remember in the class was that kua translates to cow, and that's Germanic, right? Boeuf translates to beef, and that's French. Germanic languages and Germanic cultures were viewed below the French. So the upper class eats boeuf, the lower class eats kua. And to this day, it's like if you want to show that you're somebody, you're a boeuf. You're a boeuf yeah. boof eater. You eat beef. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's still on menu. Yes, menu. You see it on menus today. So even to this day, those hangups show up in these very subtle ways that we don't even recognize. And we don't even know that we're like repeating these processes these over and over and over and over again. So, I mean, it's hard to break people free from these concepts because they're still trapped in this weird, this weird thing of status. I think that's the part. Yeah, that keeps bringing me back to the part where it's. It's a little sad because it's terrible. It's, it's a hamster wheel, and like there is it's no. It's terrible. It doesn't matter how you put it out there. It's kind of a trap. And well, you know are when you here. when you ask us like if like about opening a restaurant, like I have to say. You know, and I was talking about, like, well, what I would love to open and what I think would work. Like, if given my device, like, open a restaurant, like, no, I don't serve beef. Right. I don't serve beef. It's horribly inefficient. But that would be an affront <laughs> to the society, to all Texas society. What, what like, do you mean you don't serve beef? I don't beef. serve beef. Sorry, like, buddy. I only serve long pig. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, to soylent green is people. <laughs> like, I mean, hardly anything. I feel like there's nothing that's like, uh, you know, like 
You say like, oh, you know, no guns allowed, sure. Right. But it's like, yeah, we don't serve beef. You're yeah. Like, Whoa. It's big problem. <laughs> you yeah. know, the flip side of that is bugs. Like, we've got all these yes. hang up with bugs. Bugs are amazing, man. Did we talk about bugs? We did talk about bugs. We talked about bugs. Yeah, so yeah, for okay. sure. Cool. You all know, right. and bugs are like, like, in a weird way, bugs are the answer. But you know what bugs are? Bugs are things that you prim- don't want to look at. Eat. You don't want to look at. So, I uh, spent a lot of time in Oaxaca. Like, I Dude, w- Oaxacan roasted crickets. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so at a bar, like, they're like, you're just they're like eat- candy. Yeah, you're just eating them. They're, all- they're like, just, yeah, you're I'm just eating them all the time. It's just like crispy <laughs> tamarind, whatever. And, dude, during cricket season, what else are you going to do? They're everywhere. You just harvest the hell out of those suckers. So, like, I Man. went to. Uh, I'm getting on Amazon. I went to a rest. <laughs> I went to a restaurant that, like, so, okay, so. Just the wait first- till, like, mid-June. They're going to be out here on your stuff. I think it was, like, 2006. It turned out <clears throat> I had gone down there, and there was this massive teacher strike that I'd heard about. Like, but uh, I don't know. I didn't get the full story. The My Spanish wasn't as good as it is now, but. I'd gone to actually visit a friend halfway down, and she didn't mention it. So I get on a bus. I get down there. I go down. It literally looks like Beirut. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, what the hell is going on? I go to a hostel. There's only me and one other person in the whole hostel. And, like, they haven't had this teacher strike. I mean, there was burned out cars. There was barbed wire. There was That's just, just crazy. Like, yeah. And, like, literally I just drove right in or took the bus right into it without even knowing it. I wish our teachers were more militant. But, um... <laughs> So I, I ended up, I was like, okay, I want to go to this road. They're like, oh, it's a really traditional place. <laughs> and I ate this chili relleno with these crickets in it. Now, they're, they're awesome at a bar. They're right. crunchy. They're whatever. Right. Stuffed inside a chili, like that texture. Didn't, didn't strike home with you? No, but they were, I was the only person and it was like this husband and wife. I was like, I just ate it all. I was like, Hey, thanks a lot. It was fantastic. And like, well, you know, sometimes I got get- like to the next alley and I couldn't hold it. I just, I just <laughs> threw up. I was, the literal texture of these things. Um, oh my God. Ugh, well, what? you know, you can't, you know, you can't just throw crickets in anything, obviously. <laughs> this is a very <laughs> apparently they've been doing this for you know a thousand yeah. years. Like the mm. beautiful thing is, you know, some traditions are based out of necessity. Some traditions are based out of like benef- they're beneficial. There's all kinds of reasons for traditions. Uh, a friend of mine, Josh, I love Josh, uh, Joshua Fisher. You're probably never going to hear this, but shout out to you. He's He's an, ama- he's an amazing guy, and he went to uh, China one time, and he was honored by the family that he stayed with, and they were like, they gave him the thousand-year-old egg. And, you know. Where's the one with the parsley? It's, no, no, we're not talking like the embryo egg, like you eat like a... Oh, the, we're like, talking the like, pink one. We're talking the black fermented oh, yeah. buried egg. Oh, yeah. That's been like stored in a clay jar for six months like on the back hills because you know eggs don't last forever. No, that those are pretty good though. Those are pretty good though. I don't think his was exceptional. I think his was um I think he ate his because obviously it would have been a front to his host family to like not eat it, but he 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 has since not ordered the thousand year old egg at in any way, shape or form. But, oh yeah. But you know what I mean? But that tradition of like preserving that egg is just something that, like, I mean, they figured out, like, what can we do? Well, we could put it in the jar, in the dark, the dirt, and, like, you know, when we're really hungry and, like, whoever is up on the high hill comes down and, like, steals all of our rice, we still have, like, a plan B. It's right. like, right. you know. Plan when, E. Yeah, it's like triple redundancy in the food world, you right, know. Right. And, mm. you know, so sometimes those traditions are, like, you know, out of necessity, but you don't have to stick with them. Right. Like, and I mean, whatever, like, and not that I was absolutely, that's, that's why I went there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I went there for this. I want to try, you know, I want to try everything. And like, it was like, like just chew, chewing it up. I'm like, mm, I this, sure I'm already, my mind is already like backfiring. My <laughs> <laughs> 
I did a. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm like thumbs upping the like couple. They're like, "Do you like them?" Like, oh, absolutely. That's funny. <laughs> when I was uh, so, I on our last at the, our last conversation, I mentioned that I went to uh, UT, and I recently, like last year, almost like two years now, I I received my degree in anthropology from UT, and when I was doing a research project for. Uh, uh, Native American foods. I got to get into the library and dig down deep into like what people ate before and post conquest, and I got to look at like um, you know uh, basically the the shipping manifest of what would have been shipped off to like an Indian reservation in Minnesota versus what those Indians would have been eating, and it's like it's so stark the difference. It's like okay, you go from like <laughs> you go from like mallard and fresh harvested wild rice which is not a rice it's a kind of grass right right and and blueberries to like salt pork coffee and sugar yeah it's like okay honestly like if we all had the choice we'd be like yeah i'm gonna go to the restaurant that has like the duck and the wild rice and the blueberries not so much the salt pork and the rice you know the and the coffee and the sugar unless it's the breakfast joint in which case you always get like coffee sugar and salt pork but one of the things I came across was this guy was a study on uh, indigenous peoples and, and insect eating. And it was this huge, huge point of accessibility for foods in the United States. And I'm going to venture a guess, maybe an uneducated guess, but that, a guess that it's this huge point of reference and accessibility all over the world. But the attitude, again, like everyone who came across these, the people, especially in California, they said, you know, like, oh, they're diggers because they, they dig for ants and, they, and they're hoppers because they, like, catch grasshoppers or they're buggers or, like, all, all these, like, really demeaning names because they're, these people are gathering these, this, these insects. And it was, like, it was so absurd because here's a, a, a perfectly fine food source that has obviously been working for thousands of years. <laughs> right, right. Right? For and millennia. It, it, and it might be, it might be on the, our current trajectory, yeah. the last one we have. Right. You know, but the attitude is like, well, right. you know, I just don't eat bugs. <laughs> well, it's like, well, fucking starve them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, if that's but the it's case. interesting that we're so self-destructive in a, in a sense that like now it's like that may be the answer. Right, but the attitude is that, but that attitude is based on this idea that the bugs are beneath me. Yeah, no, it's, it's like oh, well, everything you know. that I, I hate to, I, I think this is the Status. third time I've say this, said this, but you know, it's like it's a little sad. Everything, you know, it's like the way human you know, human the, beings are. Well, and like the the, 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 the ego thing to right? me as yeah. a as a chef, like I'm kind of like, okay, like us, but it's like one of my ultimate goals, like really that was gonna get thrown into the garbage. I want to make a meal out of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I always tell yeah. our new hires, <laughs> so, we have. I love that it's become like a, a law now that like a, a city ordinance that you have to compost. Right. Um, my daughter was going to school. Hi, PJ. Hey, PJ. Hanging in like You're a trooper. Adorable. You are a trooper. You by are the way. adorable, She's by so the way. Bored. She's so <laughs> bored. She's like all these old dudes talking this nonsense. Oh, I forgot my Batman fidget spinner. <laughs> she would have loved that like an hour ago. <laughs> she was going to school at Casa de Luz. And I love Casa de Luz. Casa de Luz does. I do not like the place. But anyway. They have the most. Good mission statement. It's all a bunch of mush. Though. They have the they most three flavorless co- Three food. colors of mush. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no salt. There's no sweet. It's very flavorful. It's based on like, I mean, but for what, like the interestingly enough, and we kind of touched on this the last conversation, if you back away from like the, the, the culinary experience and you start eating a very saltless, sweetless diet, your tongue comes back to life. And it's amazing. And sometimes I will just do like months at Casa de Luz before I eat anything else, just so simply I can re-experience food because there's so much salt, there's so much sweet. And it doesn't mean if it's salt in the sense of like just salt as a mineral or it's a soy sauce or there's something going or there's butters there's like that has salt in it. There's all these things coming at me. Sometimes your, your senses are so bombarded 
that you just got to back away and, and forget the training and then start with a, a blank palette. And her school, you know, the, the kids didn't always like the food, but because it was like it wasn't fatty and it wasn't salty and it wasn't didn't have the sweets. It didn't have like, the, the appeal to a young growing body. But they f- they composted everything, and everything went into a bucket, and everything went to a, a yard or a garden or a pig farm, and they moved all that stuff. And so to this day, since we have this new ordinance now where you have to compost stuff to keep it out of the landfills, I, I find that I have to teach the, the aspiring chefs that there's a difference between feeding the stock pot and feeding the compost pile. <laughs> Yeah, and I was I, I was amazed by this. I used to work at um, the AT and T Conference Center, you know, where the Carillon oh. is. And like one day, somebody said, "Like, let's start like making a stock." And like, I was just blown away by like what people didn't know. Like anything Could, that did not go in the people trash. People just like, oh, like cabbage leaf. I'm like, oh my Why? god, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. It's just because you don't throw it away doesn't mean no. it goes in the stock. No. It's, it was you out. gotta feed the stock pot, you gotta feed the compost pile. Yeah. You don't, you don't put you don't put the carrot root in <laughs> it's in the stock like pot. Cabbage the tomato but I'm just like, no, 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 no. no. This isn't the stock that I don't <laughs> What? No, and it's no. interesting because nobody, and this is like going back to that conversation earlier about like knowing and your craft. I, and I guess like, that's, a, that's what I was about to say. It's like, I guess I'm older and grew up in this, but I'm like, whoa, no, no, no. There no broccoli stems. You don't put broccoli stems in. This is like. We, at the counter, we, we, you know, we make a vegetable stock that we use for like cooking the quinoa in, that we cook the, the, the greens in. And the idea is to recycle stuff. So if you know, for example, we have a chopped salad that we shave carrots on top. Eventually, you get to a point where you just can't shave anymore off a carrot. And it goes, and, and so you're like, what do I do with this good carrot? Well, the good part, you chop off and you put in the stock pot. The root goes into the compost pile. Right. But people just throw the whole thing in there. Yeah. They'll throw the cores for like uh, the red peppers in there. And you're like, why are you putting red pepper seeds? Well, that's what I'm saying. In the, the like stock pot. sulfury, like. And, and this yeah. is part of the crafting. It's like, no, 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 you don't put the sulfury parts. It's gross. It's the stock. Why like, are you putting the most bitter, god awful right. thing? Right. This is why we don't, this is why we cut the pith out. This is like, yeah. Yeah, it's just. Like, yeah. <laughs> why are you taking the thing you cut out because it's gross and been building a, a liquid off of this right, stuff? Right, right. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. And they're like, whoa. And you're like, okay, look, mm-hmm. I understand that you're an aspiring chef and that you want to grow, but at some point you actually have to stop and think <laughs> about what you're doing because, uh, you know. This that's is interesting a, because and, it is pretty elementary, right? And, and, yeah. and, also, yeah. and also, like, with the, as much information we have available to us. Can't you Google it? Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Like, I mean, somewhere there's a YouTube that tells you, you know what? Well, how don't to throw make your, stock? Don't yeah. throw your trash in the stock pot. Right. So now I find, like I said, I have to find myself telling people, okay, look, you can feed. You have to. You have to feed the compost, and you have to feed the stock pot. You can take the broccoli stems and you can cut off like the hard outer center and you can cut up the insides and use them for something good but the hard outer the hard outer covering of the center of the stem whatever it does not go in the stock pot it goes in the tr- it goes in the compost you know the inside of the bell pepper does not go in the compost it goes in the compost it does not go in the stock the end of the carrot goes so in. you've seen people throw the inside of a bell pepper absolutely in a stock? i've seen people throw the 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 bitter what, what, outside. What it become? And I, I was mean, I was surprised. It like, becomes gross. Yeah. Was in like, what it becomes. Well, it becomes yeah, bitter, gross. yeah, bitterness. And, but like I was like, uh, where you guys are. <laughs> I like, mean, it's like the a inside small of a, a small enough place where, like, seen in a hotel where, like, they kind of made a like blanket tons. statement, and everyone's just yeah. like robotically like, okay, do do do. The only know? saving grace is that, mm. for example, with us, we use the stock pot. We use the the vegetable stock that we use to cook, uh, to cook the collard greens in. So the only saving grace is that collard greens are so abusively yeah that you can you can do, you can just pound the hell out <laughs> that, of no, like really There's you can just cook them in like like 
you could cook them in toxic ways, and they would probably turn out to be halfway decent. And then shoot at them with a shot. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only saving grace. Yeah. But the problem is that nobody knows that. Yeah. Like, they don't have the foundational knowledge to understand that, like, oh, we can get away with this because. And all of these, like, cra- crazy, okay, so, like, collard greens, like, has a thing, like, you know, we've been eating these for years, but, like, I see on a Whole Foods, but they, it literally said, like, collard greens, the new kale. And no. I'm like, it's the old, like. It's not the new kale. It's not the new kale. It's. It's frankly the old kale. It's like, the old kale. It's like, <laughs> like there's a thing down here called pokeweed. Oh yeah, poke salad. Poke salad. Poke there's salad. a song, baby. Poke <laughs> salad, Annie. Right? Yeah. So you got to do all this stuff to it to cook it and make it taste odd, like to make it like edible. But it's free on the and it's side of the water, <laughs> and it's yeah. everywhere. Right? It's slightly poisonous <laughs> if you don't treat it right. That's a disclaimer. But the songbirds love it, and a bunch of other animals love it. But the idea is that, you know, no matter what you cook it in, it just kind of all tastes the same. So, like, for, for us, our collard greens, we make really good collard greens, but it's not because we cook them in vegetable stock. It's because we fucking bury them in bacon fat, right? Yeah, yeah. So the vegetable stock is, like, if someone messes it up, it doesn't really matter. But the problem is, is that there's no foundation of knowledge for them to know that they're messing it up. Because we also use the vegetable stock for our quinoa, and the quinoa that we use goes into our vegetable, our veggie burger. And when you get to that point, you're like, okay, now that flavor profile has the potential of popping out and taking something that should be tasting like A, and now it tastes like B. And if for some, for some bad reason someone grabs the quinoa that was cooked in vegetable stock and not with the water, and they use it for the summer porridge, and now it's paired with the strawberries and the blackberries and the toasted coconut and the heavy cream, now they've got a big bowl of like really bitter <laughs> fucking yeah, quinoa. Yeah. And everyone's like, man, summer porridge is gross because they're not getting all the sweetness they should be getting from the quinoa, right? So... You know, what I'm getting at is like, you know, there's our, our, our cultural disconnect has translated into our culinary disconnect. We're just not aware of what we're doing. And it's really hard to find people who have an authentic interest and knowledge and are capable of translating and navigating those dynamics, man. It's it's a nightmare. Well, okay, so like, um, if I c- could like trade like trade like half our kitchen guys, uh, <laughs> like our like American guys for like they've been working in restaurants for years for like. Mexican guys that have just like picked it up. Yeah, I right. mean, I would. You know, I don't want to be a, like a racist or an un, uh, or an anti nationalist. Isn't <laughs> that what's the thing now? Why don't you love America, man? But like, I mean, not just you know, not for nothing, but like fucking like American white boys. They don't want to like work. They they don't. They don't want to work. They don't want to learn. Right, and like, and they're disconnected. And honestly, like the guys that come up from, and like, and and we're all like, at a at a. Uh, so like, my mother cooked all the time, but like, so I'm 43 years old. So like, I think we're at a point like some guy is like 26. Like maybe his mother didn't cook at all. Has no idea. Right. No context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No background. You know. The weird thing is, is that, like, we have people in our kitchen from all over the place. We have, I know, baby. We have guys that are from south of the border, north of the border, whatever. The guys from south of the border, you know, I challenged one of them the other day. I was like, you know what? I want you to make a soup. And he's like, what, 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 what kind of soup do I make? That's a good challenge. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, man. Why don't you make something? That, like, you would have eaten back home. And he was like, uh, he drew a big, long blank. He's a guy. 
guys don't make soup back home. Right, right. Right? So even though he has the <coughs> he has a reference point that allows him to make a, 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 a soup from Guatemala in this particular case, he doesn't have the skill set because back in his home world, what he's doing is a uh, is is gendered roles. Right, it's a gender yeah. role. Like in America he's cooking and he's earning a living and that's a man's job. But in Guatemala, cooking for the family is a woman's job. Yeah. So in I've, a weird I've, way, I've he's that. he's at a weird he's at a weird crossroads where he's being demanded to do a man's job with a woman's knowledge and he doesn't have it. Right. It's crazy, man. It makes yeah. it very difficult. They well, really have to pee again. <laughs> well throw this on real quick. So we've uh, we've talked here for uh, we've t- we've we've had a good conversation and certainly not much about Austin. I mean, just to be frank, oh, nothing about Austin. We've gone off into the weeds. We've talked about all kinds of things, which I love. And this, I love this having, will not be episode nineteen. No, <laughs> oh, this will be episode nineteen. But I think we need to wrap it up pretty pretty soon here. Yeah, baby girl's getting tired. Yeah, um, I think she needs to close it out though. Yeah. You want to come out here and uh, here, send us off? Throw on come the here, headphones. Baby. So we have Pos- you you Posey, have Chef, Chef Phil's daughter. You want to take mine? That's all right. She's got the uh, SM7B. You want to take my headphones? There we go. She's got the mic here. So you're on the Austin All Day podcast, sweetheart. Did you have fun? Mm-hmm. Would you like to say goodbye? Bye, bye. <laughs> well, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> All right. You heard it here.